Okay, I think that it's time to begin <coughs> Assembly 2006 seminars now, and we are going to have many, many seminars and quite professional speakers here. And our first speaker is Marku Reunen, who is going to speak about Linux 4K <coughs> coding. And my name is Tapio Värmäki, and I'm your seminar host this year. So I'm introducing some speakers, but some 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 of them are quite independent are and they are doing it by themselves but <coughs> anyway if you have any questions or anything if you would like to be next year seminar speaker or anything just contact me and I, I'm trying to arrange, arrange things but anyway <coughs> now we can begin and it's time to make Mark welcome. Okay, This looks pretty much like a finished church, nobody sits in the front rows but uh, we'll manage. Okay, let's start off with a little piece of uh, 4K. Um, better start with a better one. Okay, this is kind of the thing that started it all. My first 4K with uh, Antti Silvas, the next next week of bandwagon. Thanks. Um, now that um, I think we have some time, so I'll show another, and then we'll go to the actual presentation. This is from last year, again by me and next week. <laughs> Thank you. 
Okay. Um, those were, I think, the two hits that we had. Um, so the topic, obviously, is Linux 4K intro coding. Uh, this time I showed them on this iBook. I don't have a Linux laptop, so I just used the Macintosh ports that we made. And um, I'll give a quick overview of the why Linux is good for 4K intro coding, and then deal with the different languages that we may choose, some uh, GNU-C related uh, tricks. Uh, then I'll deal with dynamic library loading, which will give you many bytes. Um, just a little about new generation. We had a soft synthesizer in routine in the 4K, uh, but uh, I'm not any specialist in that, so I'll keep it quite briefly. And then dealing with compression and send some, uh, if you use, say, C, some code level tricks and send then some tools that might help you. Okay, um, there have been Linux 4K intros for the past, say, five years. There are not many of them, but um, still, um, Linux is a good platform for 4Ks. There are numerous good tools, uh, good libraries and uh, those sorts of libraries that are available on most of, most of Linux boxes, and you can rely on that. And then the mini executable overhead of Linux, uh, that's pretty small. Not as small as, say, with a DOS-COM or so, but still very manageable. And I'll present you uh, some tricks and uh, techniques that we devised when we made these three 4K intros starting in 2003. And uh, if you are upstart in 4K coding, you better listen carefully because uh, with these tricks, it's uh, these are kind of free uh, free bytes to you. You don't need to uh, put a lot of effort to your coding. The, for example, those tools, they will give you, uh, I would say, at least 300, 400 uh, bytes easily. So, um, I'll tell you everything I know, and if you have something to add or ask, then we have time for that at the end. Okay, um, many people would start coding right away with assembly, but um, you know the pros and cons of assembly. It's uh, a lot of work. Obviously, you get the smallest possible executable with assembly, but uh, say, trying different values, parameters, and such. That's not so easy to do with assembly. But uh, if you know what you're doing, stick with assembly, and uh, you will get the smallest binary possible. Then the C, um, which uh, today is pretty good choice. I, we have used the GNU, GNU C compiler, GCC, and um, we found it pretty suitable. Well. All of these uh, three intros, they have been mainly done with C. All the effect code is in C. Then the soft synth and then, then some system level code is in assembly, but uh, C is, is our language of choice. Unfortunately, you can't use C++. At least that's my experience. Uh, there's all sorts of overhead startup code and uh, name mangling. It makes it difficult to interface with assembly language. But probably for a uh, 4K intro, you wouldn't want to have any uh, big uh, object database anyway. So I think C is pre pretty okay. And with Linux, um, I haven't seen anybody done do this. Uh, but for example, Perl is uh, pretty much available everywhere. A l like a working Linux setup must include Perl. So you might consider this. It, you could. For example, make the engine in, in C and then kind of script it with Perl because it's obviously very effective. Uh, you get very, uh, very dense code with Perl. I haven't done this, but this is just some food for thought. You might want to try this some, somewhere. But obviously, Perl alone is not enough. You can't interface to the graphics library and sound with pure Perl. And then, um, this is again something I haven't tried, but uh, at least in some Windows 4Ks, they, they use 
shader, shader code. Under Linux, it, it would definitely be GLSL. But uh, I'm not any big fan of shaders, so I won't go into this. And besides, I don't know that much about it anyway, so better keep my mouth shut about it. Okay, this is our approach. Um, system level code, soft synthesizer, and then um, startup and such. Things you need to write only once. Those are made in assembly, and then the rest is in C. All the effects um, and whatever, whatever there is. And this has proven to be quite a good approach. We ha now we have the kind of the framework written in assembly. We have the startup and soft synth and such. And then we, uh, we only, actually we have only one C file that we edit each year and then just recompile. It's, uh, there's not, not a lot of rewriting involved. Actually we just uh, change the contents of the functions <laughs> pretty much. Now probably this doesn't sound too romantic. Um, anyway, you save some effort there. And um, we've been able to release this, all of this um, under Linux, Windows, OS 10 and SGI because, uh, well, C is portable and we have just then changed the framework and just, we just took the effect code and compiled it in, on another platform and that's it. So we've been able to release all these versions on under a week. Um, okay, there is overhead with C, but uh, you probably lose your nerve a lot less than with pure assembly. Now, the natural choice, of course, was GNU C. And um, first of all, it's free and it's very available available for almost any platform, and you can do even cross-compiling. And it's, of, of course, like effective. Um, it makes good enough code. And, um, well, you would probably start dealing with uh, those uh, command line switches. And uh, if you read the manual, it says OS, it uh, creates the smallest binary. And if you try that, then it won't. But uh, Fortunately, there are some other, other parameters that make better results, like this O1, for example. That's usually better. Then O2 introduces a lot of, uh, a big set of other parameters then that you can't tweak, and that, that makes the a lot worse. So I would stick with O1 and then add a lot of those obscure parameters, like I've listed there this no inline, move all, movable, peephole, Portman, expensive optimizations and so on. And uh, like trying these individually instead of putting O2 there, which would uh, turn most of them on. And I don't know, actually I don't know what these, with what these do. For example, this force mem, I have no idea what it does, but I've used it and it's quite successful. And uh, fast math, of course, that, that will inline uh, math functions, making them like a, just single uh, uh, SPU instructions or a couple of SPU instructions. That's a good thing to have. Then this uh, short double, that's a bit l little dangerous, but uh, doubles obviously take a lot more space than uh, uh, floats. Doubles take, I guess, eight bytes and, uh, and floats take four bytes and all the constants that are stored in your, in your file, then they will take more space if, if they are double, okay? So you can compile with short double and that will automatically make all the doubles uh, float. And the only problem with this approach is that if you call external uh, uh, functions, like say from a library, and it would need a double parameter, then it, then it will break it. And uh, okay, there's a, way to circumvent it, you can uh, encapsulate code that needs uh, real doubles uh, into separate files. And that's, that's about it. This was actually a pretty, pretty useful parameter. But um, since we're dealing with compressed code, we are running the, the whole binary through gzip, then it's hard to tell which parameter set is going to be the best. 
even though uh, the binary itself would be smaller, then after compression it might actually end up being bigger. So there's no such thing as a perfect parameter set. It, once you've found a perfect parameter set and then you add or change some code after, after recompiling, you might actually end up with a bigger binary. That's a pretty, pretty um, complicated, but uh, we'll deal with that later. We have some, some methods to conquer, <coughs> conquer this. And uh, this was a big surprise to me. Um, I would expect that uh, GCC 3.3, which was new in 2003, um, I would expect it would create better binaries, like smaller binaries and so on. But actually it added some extra code there. So um, even last year I compiled the make it 4K, I compiled it with GCC um, 3.2. By my experience it creates the smallest smallest binary size. 3.1 was somewhat broken, I don't would recommend that. But uh, I haven't tried GCC 4 at all, so I don't have anything to say about that, but I would expect this 3.2 3 to be the best. Okay, um, now uh, obviously we're going to need external libraries these days. We don't bang the hardware straight. So we would need SDL and OpenGL. And it's of course very easy to use them from C, no problem. Uh, but uh, every time you introduce a new library call, it inter introduces a 70 byte overhead. And uh, if you do anything like practical in OpenGL, you would need at, at least 15 or 20 function, uh, external functions. And that's already like one and a half kilobytes and you don't want that. And um, first solution, okay, this is something you, you probably want to do anyway. You would uh, say uh, if you need GL vertex 2F and GL vertex 3F, you would only want to use, say, the 3F version and leave out the GL vertex 2F. This is something you would, you would do. And, um, but this, is this alone is not enough. We still need at least those 10 to 20 functions. And if we don't want that one and a half kilobyte overhead there. So there's a solution. Okay, there's, there's been some discussion about the use of SDL. Some consider it lame and they have might have a point there. But uh, these days there are good reasons why to use SDL. Everybody that watches demos on Linux has a SDL. Then the compo rules uh, approve, and that's of course the thing that matters. And then the third thing is that uh, once you start dealing with xlib and glx, you will probably create some bad code and uh, make some crucial mistake there. It will run on your machine, but on some other machine it will freeze or so. So it's hard to, hard to get these things correct. So I would definitely stick with SDL. It's proven to work. But uh, whichever you choose, glute, that's, that's pretty bad. Wouldn't go with that, but it's of course possible. And uh, thing, the dynamic library loading schema will pr present you, it will work equally with GLX or glute or whatever you choose. Okay, so we want to open the libraries ourselves and that's really straightforward. We would just use the DL open function call and for that we pass the name of the library and then DL sim with that we can like get the get the functions from the library. Okay, we get function pointers from there and through those point pointers we can then call the call the functions of of the libraries. And uh, I've seen some people do this in C uh, but I would prefer assembly because there's, you get this done in very small amount of code. And after this, it's about 20, might be a little more per function now that's the overhead there and uh, that's definitely an improvement. Actually here the, um, it's pretty interesting that the, so the overhead depends on the size of the name of the function, the length of the name of the function. 
the lo longer the name, then it's stored there in, in your binary. And you must remember to put this LDL on the command line when you're linking your otherwise dynamic linking functions won't be available. Okay, um, a little thing about music generation. I think last year uh, there was a speech about uh, soft synthesizers, uh, so I won't go to this in any, any detail, and I'm not any, uh, any DSP specialist anyway. But the f matter of fact is that I wrote the soft synth that we have um, in cooperation with some musicians. They had some, uh, it went like this. Okay, is this a good soft synth for, synth for you? Okay, then the musician would try it out and then come back with a list of improvements that he needed. And then I would be like, I don't ca cram, I, I can't cram all that in, but I will probably give you the delay loop e echo. Is that okay? And it was this kind of a negotiation that then we ended up with the features that, was that we had. But obviously in a 4K, uh, 4K synthesizer, you, d you can't have much in there. And um, that was written in pure assembly. Uh, I guess you could do this in C as well, but here we wanted to save as much bytes as possible because this is again a routine that we use each year. So it needed to be written only once. And uh, we have a large number of channels, and then we have those basic waveforms like uh, sinus, um, saw, square, and then noise. And uh, that's pretty easy to write. Um, I'm sure that's, that's not a problem for any, any decent coder. And then we needed ADSR so that the sound would, wouldn't be just ordinary beeps. And um, in some Windows demos they have, or 4 k they have used uh, MIDI. You, you probably quite easily notice when it's MIDI, it, it sounds kind of lame, but uh, again, by filtering the MIDI output a little, you could probably get some good, uh, good results. But under Linux, it's not possible. And in practice, you have to stick with OSS. And um, because not everybody has even also available. So it's OSS and it gives you just the, well, you know how it goes, it's just a bunch of samples you write to the OSS and that's, that's all you get. And um, okay, now we had beeps, we had ADSR added to those beeps a little better, still sound a bit crude. Uh, for bass drums, you need frequency sweep, that's easy to implement only some like ten, tens of bytes, not any big deal. Amplitude modulation, this is, uh, this is really useful. You get all those sorts of uh, synth sounds like from the old synths of the 90s or 80s, those wah, wah, wah kind of sounds. And uh, then the delay loop echo, which is very easy to implement, but it, I think that's almost the best feature that we have in this soft synth. So it's just like, like a couple of lines of code you for, to make this delay loop echo, but it already makes the sound, uh, sound a lot fatter, so to speak. Mm. Here I mentioned that the size of the soft synth and the tune together compressed are one and a half kilobytes. So that's already pretty much. We only have two and a half kilobytes for the actual actual code and graphics. But to these days you need to have music, otherwise the product will look kind of pale, especially compared to the competitors. Um, okay, this is not any complicated thing to write. If you have a musician, uh, he will come up with a long list of different, uh, different uh, features that he would like to have. And uh, if you want to use our synth, it's freely available. All of the so source codes of, of, of these intros, they are freely available, but, uh, uh, well, it's handwritten assembly. So you kind of, I g guess you get the point, it's hard to understand the code. But, uh, well, feel free to look at it. That's why, that's why it was released. And then 
one problem, of course, is the how to get the music. You, if you are a good coder musician, then there's no problem. But otherwise, uh, you will probably want to make the life a little easier for the musician. Um, Antti, our next freak, uh, composed the music for all of these uh, three intros, and he's a coder as well. So it was no problem for him using some, say, uh, editor and writing the notes in an assembly file and then compiling it and uh, running uh, and listening to the sounds. Uh, but uh, an ordinary musician probably doesn't want to do this. So if you don't have the coder musician amongst you, then you um, could think of writing a simple front end or a converter. Say XM or mod, they are pretty uh, good starting point. You could give some, uh, for example, you could generate samples with your synth and then give them to the musician which would, who would use them in a, as samples in, in a mod file or, or um, XM. And then you would just take out the notes from the XM and then use them, use them in your 4K. This sort of uh, converter would probably make life easier for everybody. Okay. And then about the compression. Um, those of you who have done any 4K or 64K com, uh, coding under Linux are pretty ab uh, aware of this GZIP sub thingy. Um, but I'll go through it just briefly. Uh, so the other, uh, other coders, coders for other platforms, they can be envy. And again, claim this as lame because uh, it's too easy. Um, okay, the 4K that you run is actually a sh shell script which has a stub uh, in the beginning and then the rest of the f script is the compressed binary and then the stub, uh, the script will uh, uncompress the garbage there in the tail and then uh, run the actual, actual binary. And um, unfortunately, I can't remember the name of the guy who I worked with this. But uh, um, here's our attempt at 56 bytes. That's almost nothing. And uh, what it does, this tail command here, it kind of takes the binary garbage uh, from the end of the script and then uh, decompresses it through uh, Zcat and then puts uh, turns on the ex executable flag and then runs the product and, and uh, removes the, the binary and then exits. And there are some, some things, you would probably think of some little uh, tricks to um, already optimize this. But first of all, we need to use the temporary directory. Uh, because for example, if you run this from a CD-ROM, you can't write to the uh, default directory. That's, so you must use temp, temp and uh, this is all also stated in the assembly rules, for example, and that I think this is a good rule. Okay, we must set the executable flag. One guy thought that uh, we could use probably tar packaging there, and tar would hold the uh, bits there. But then again, th there was too much uh, overhead from using tar. So we must set, set the executable flag there. And then an important thing, you would probably think of omitting removing the binary from the temp, but uh, this is pretty dangerous. If there are numerous users on the machine, then uh, when somebody else tries to run the product, then there's already in the temp, there's this I, and uh, it can't be recreated. And then the, the other user can't run the product at all. So this is why it needs to be removed. Don't leave it away. And uh, it's 56 bytes, and I've s spent too many hours picking bytes here and there out of this, out of this sub. Uh, so feel free to improve, please. Uh huh. Okay, we'll 
go to that when we talk about tools. I, I don't, I haven't heard about the tool, but that's really a valuable trip, tip for everybody, not a trip. Uh, or might be even a trip if you are so fascinated about it. Um, okay. And then some just observations. Um, dealing with compressed code is not straightforward. If you manage to remove from the assembly file several uh, instructions and then you go and compile and wait, okay, how many bytes do, did I get? Then you end up with a binary that's like 10 bytes bigger. That's, that's a, a thing that usually happens. So it's very unpredictable. And uh, so you need to take out large amounts of code to get any, any improvements. And um, the same is true for compiler flags. After, after compression, you can't really tell how many bytes you're gonna, you're gonna gain by trying out those compiler flags. But we have a tool for that. Then, okay, we have plenty of time. Um, then some code level tricks. Pretty straightforward, pretty si simple, but might be of use for you. Just some observations that I've made during these three years. Um, this is not any good coding practice. Probably your teacher would spank you for doing this, but you should remove subroutines. There's always uh, overhead introduced when you have subroutines. Okay, you can't do this endlessly. Uh, or you can, but then, then your code will actually be, be mis messy. And uh, at some point this might um, be a bad bad advice, but uh, if you have a small subroutines that are called, for example, ones, then you, you should just inline them by hand, and that's, that's about it. And th we already went through this floats instead of doubles. There's nothing new there. Okay, then there's something I noticed. Uh, if you have local arrays in a function, uh, if you declare them as static, it removes the init code from the uh, subroutine, and you get some bytes. Then, it, then the, the arrays are placed in the global data segment, and uh, they don't need to be initialized every time you call the subroutine. So you gain some bytes by doing this. Mm, and then there's this little pseudo-random generator that I wrote. This is from some old Microbitty magaz magazine originally, and then I just converted it to uh, Intel assembly. And uh, you, well, you, every now and then, you would probably need random, uh, uh, random numbers. And using the external RAND of, of, of C library would create uh, some overhead. So you might want to try this. This is just some uh, about A little more than 10 bytes, probably. Compressed. And this, I've, I've tried this, and it, this, this works well enough. Probably it's not uh, good enough for cryptography, but you will probably use it for that anyway. OK. Um, finally, we go to the tools. Um, I've used NASM, the NetWide Assembler. This is a matter of a taste ag again. Some of you might want to use the ATC syntax, but I'm kind of grown with Turbo Assembler, and so I want to use the ordinary inter Intel syntax. And you get fancy things like ink bin to include your binary data there without any, any extra hassle. And you get macros and free, and that's just one wonderful piece of software. And then this Elf Kickers package, that was really a big help. I actually didn't know about this S-Trip uh, tool before uh, Yellow Rose of Texas. And I played with the usual, usual strip that comes with the system. And I stripped all, out all sorts of segments there. And I already gained some bytes here and there. But with this S-Trip, I gained something like 100 bytes. So you should probably look at the Elf Kickers package. You get it. Uh, it's packaged in Debian, for example. 
and you will find the S script command there, and that's that's really. I don't know what it does to the elf header. It's probably something really dirty, but uh, anyway, the the binaries still work, and I'm happy with that. So it's very very effective. And then there's this little tool I wrote, um, this GC math masher, and um, we've already talked about the command line parameters and how many of them there are. So um, this is a very crude ap application. It just takes a set of parameters and then compiles and over and over and uh, the application over and over again with the parameters and then it tells you which parameter set was the best. And it takes some time. Um, on my old Celeron it took something like uh, an hour to test the parameter set. But after all, I, I got, um, for example, from Jeregret, I got 74 bytes, and these are free bytes. And you, of course, you shouldn't uh, do this constantly after each change, because there won't be that much change uh, in the binary side. But before you submit the entry, or if you need a, say a couple of bytes, just a couple of bytes more, then you might want to r run this and then um, you would probably get some extra. Yep, this is a very crude tool. Feel free to improve it. It's open source again. You can find it at least in Poet. And um, well, if, if somebody wants to come up with a better idea, uh, like a more sophisticated heuristical tool, uh, I'm all for it. But this, this does, does what it's supposed to. And I was pretty sad kind of to find that I would have gotten 74 bytes of shit regret and how much of rich content I would have put in the 74 bytes. Well, probably not. Um, if you are into serious hacking, there's this uh, whirlwind tutorial on creating really teensy elf executables for Linux by Brian Rayta. And uh, in this, they create the minimal elf header they really, they really tweak it very far, like they put code in inside, uh, like, like in place of numbers that are supposed to be there, and all sorts of dirty tricks. I haven't done this, and I probably don't want to do it anyway, because the, after this, you can't really be sure if it works on every, everybody's setup, or in the future when the kernel changes. But uh, there are some 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 really neat tricks they have there, anyway. And then Timo Wigren has written a how-to about 4K intros in GNU Linux. Some basic tricks presented there. Pretty much, I've pretty much covered everything that's there. Uh, but if you want to have some, some sort of reference, you, you might want to check that web page. And uh, finally, if you want to see how we have done those things, then full source or both C versions, like the multi-platform versions and then the assembly and C versions, like the originals, they are all, all available on our web page. Feel free to check them out. I don't give a shit if you use the code or, and don't even credit us. I've, I've written the co code once and that, that was the most important and fun part for me. I don't really care if anybody uses this for their own profit. Uh, but I would recommend taking the source of make it 4K because that was the last and uh, includes most of the tricks that I've mentioned. And but even then I didn't have this GC, GC measure, so it's, it's not there, but you will find it in Poet. Okay, that's about the presentation. Thanks you, thank you, you have been a great audience and uh, I think new, now we have time for some questions and comments. You already mentioned the ZZIP uh, compressor, which I will definitely check out and, and, and recommend to everybody. Other comments, questions? Um, it's an uh, ordinary attack decay sustained release, like the, the uh, envelope for the waveform. And it makes it sound a little more, a little richer than just ordinary beeps.
Um, I've heard of those, but I haven't tried it myself. But probably they could be useful. So a little related to Perl here again. But uh, okay, I've, I've heard of people thinking about that, but I haven't haven't seen anybody do that in Linux. Might be might be that I'm just not aware of such a thing. But I agree there's potential there because you can create very dense code in pseudo code instead of instead of machine language. Uh, we tried that, but bzip is better for uh, long files, and these are like uh, under 10 kilobyte uncompressed. And we tried bzip with all the switches, and uh, and uh, zzip was better for for this. Actually, there's one thing I didn't mention. It read there. You probably noticed it, but uh, this this zzip best, of course, that's easy. Uh, it will create the smallest package, but then there's this minus n, because gzip um, places the name of the archive in, in the file unless you give it a minus n, and after that you get some something like five bytes probably. But anyway, we want to squeeze its minimum. Okay, that's an interesting approach. We didn't think of that. There are all sorts of things I haven't uh, tried, but uh, fortunately we had the coder musician <laughs> who was uh, willing to write assembly language as, as the music. <laughs> really thought of that. I'm just an old Unix part who likes C, so <laughs> this might be my, my omission here, but uh, many other languages than C, they are not as uh, integrated into uh, Linux or Unix, and then they must uh, have some sort of uh, runtime libraries, or uh, they link in a lot of startup code or so. So uh, I would uh, probably expect it to be bigger because C is so so uh, unified with uh, Unix. There's there's like minimal overhead with C, I would say. But well, if you find find out if it would work, then please let me know. Could you rephrase that? I could hear it you quite. Uh, yep, but then that's kind of extra. You yeah. would need to have that installed, and uh, I don't think many people have that. That's that, that's the problem, obviously. Okay, I think we have time for at least one question. I'm aware of the tool, and I thought uh, when I searched through the web, of course, for interesting tools, I thought that this could be the tool, so I didn't wouldn't need to write the GC matcher at all. But um, the problem, I think, it's it's of course way more advanced than this brute force crap that I made. But uh, I think uh, the problem there is that uh, um, the compression there makes things very unpredictable. Uh, running speed is, I think it's m more, it's easier to uh, improve on, like with with sophisticated algorithms, but you really can't tell how, how the GZIP will 
we end up com compressing a binary. Okay, if that's all, I, I thank you.